the odds of me surviving the second cancer was roughly 6%. But the chances of me surviving both of them, it's pretty much the same as winning the lottery four times in a row with the same numbers. As you mentioned earlier, you know, I'm, I'm, I climbed Everest with one lung. People ask me, how is that even physiologically possible? It's possible because I have taught myself how to nearly every breath utilize the entire function of my lung. You can change how you see the world. The world's not going to change. The world's not going to change for you. And if you want to see a different perspective on the world, you need to change. Today's guest was voted one of the top eight most inspirational people in history. At 13, he was diagnosed with cancer and he was given only two weeks to live, which he did. And then at 16, he was diagnosed with a different type of cancer and given only a 6% chance of survival, which he did. And while that's remarkable in itself, it's what he chose to do with the rest of his life that is so inspiring. He's gone on to be the only person, the only person in history to climb Mount Everest, to climb the highest mountain on each continent, to ski to the South Pole, ski to the North Pole, completing the Explorer's Grand Slam. Now here's the question. How did a boy who struggled to crawl eight feet from his hospital bed to the bathroom go on to redefine impossible by climbing 29,000 35 feet to the top of the world's tallest peak with only one lung. You have to hear this story. So please help me welcome to We Do Hard Things, Sean Swarner. I guess the place that I wanted to start is, you know, you have your story out there and, and it's front and center in terms of as a child, you know, the, the fact that you had to battle cancer the fact that you had to just i mean watching your documentary is just like you know I'm, I'm a dad i got four kids my oldest is 14 my youngest is seven like right in the age range where you're fighting cancer and you're battling and you're doing all that stuff but you're seeing it you're living it and so i'm watching your parents talk about your battle and thinking my goodness my kids and i'm thinking about myself at the same age now that you're older how do you look back on that time? Pretty much from that same perspective. I look, I look back at it and think that I had it easy. What my parents went through is probably worse than what I went through. Uh, I, I don't have any kids, but I can only imagine how difficult it would be to watch your firstborn son, like for you, your 14 year old, so let's just say, you know, your, your 14 year old, uh, the doctor comes up to you and just starts talking to you while your child is laying in the hospital bed. And then he says, I'm sorry, but your, your child has advanced four stage Hodgkin's lymphoma and we expect him to live for three months. Yeah. So looking back at it, I can I can only imagine what my parents went through because you you can't go in there and and take the cancer away. You can't hop into your child's life and 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 do that battle for them. Yeah. How did that How did that change the dynamic at home? It, it wow, it, it changed it quite a bit to be honest with you. Um, we were your your typical I guess Midwest family, if there is a typical Midwest family. Um, but when when I was diagnosed, so in, in my family, it's myself, my brother, my younger brother, who's three years younger than I am, and then my mom and my dad. And what happened was when I got sick, Ma and I was in the hospital. Mom and Dad spent most of the time you know, ninety miles away in Columbus, Ohio, and my brother miles. was. So you were you were in like a specialized children's hospital type of thing. No, actually, I was treated as an adult, believe it or not. Ah. Um, so the two, the two cancers were 13 and 16, but because I was, uh, I was born and raised and I lived in such a small town in Ohio, they, they just didn't have the facilities to, to treat cancer. So initially that they, initially they thought it was, uh, pneumonia and it's, 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 it's pretty difficult to cure cancer by sucking in a nebulizer. So I was I wasn't getting any better. <laughs> Then that's why they took me to the nearest hospital, which was Columbus. And the, how that whole thing came about was my mom got on the phone with one of her friends that she graduated with, who happened to be, I want to say, the, the president of a hospital in Columbus. 
And she asked him, if one of your children got sick and had cancer, who would you send them to? And he immediately said, Dr. Dr. Meller Davis. So that was, that was all it took. Mom was like, okay, we're going to Columbus, which was 90 miles away. So while I was in the hospital there, mom and dad were, you know, initially both of them were there. My brother, Seth, was kind of pawned off to family members and friends. So it, it kind of, it, it divided us for a while. But I think my brother did the best he could to understand why that was happening. Um, and, it, and it was interesting because the first time I was 13, he was 10. And both of us had to grow up really, really quickly. Uh, me especially. And then I think my brother, it, he, hopefully he doesn't listen to this. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> but he, he, he got into a lot of trouble in school because I think he was try, acting out looking for that attention yeah. that I was taking from my parents, you know, that I was taking from the family. But then the second time I was 16, he was 13. He went through it again the first time. But then I, I was at 16, I was getting made fun of. You know, for being for being uh, bald, overweight, then skinny, and then just not fitting in. I I, just, I looked like a freak. You know, sometimes I was sixty pounds overweight. I, I had no eyebrows, no nothing, and I, I felt like my grandpa because I had I moved incredibly slowly because my joints were so swollen from the prednisone. But he saw people making fun of me, and he, my younger brother Seth, he stood up for for, for me. And, and he, um, I didn't find this out until later, but he actually pulled some people aside and explained to them what was going on and said something like, you know, imagine it was your brother and he was going through that. How would you feel if he, if he was dying? Yeah, that's heavy. And so Absolutely. your parents are an hour and a half away and you're an hour and a half away and you're fighting all of this stuff. Um, At the time, I mean, it, it, it must have just been not only completely overwhelming, but um, can you even remember, like, I'm curious, can you remember what it felt like to be that? Or do you just have the memories looking back on it now? Like, has it been reprogrammed? And, and now all you can do is just look back at it through the lens of where you are today? Or can you snap back there? It's 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 weird because the second cancer I had, the the treatments were so harsh, um, the doctors didn't want me to remember them. So I was three months, basically three months in the hospital, then one month of radiation, and then ten more months of, of chemotherapy back in the hospital again. And because the treatments were so harsh, the doctors gave me something. I don't know what it was, but. Essentially, I was in a medically induced coma for the time that I was in the hospital, except for that one month of radiation. And I don't really remember much about that. But what's crazy is wherever I go, I, I do my best to go visit local hospitals and, and meet with some patients. And I, I love that that camaraderie and I love that conversation that we have. And what's, what, what really gets me sometimes is I'll smell saline or I'll smell something in the hospital that'll all of a sudden trigger a memory. And I'll, I'll just look at whoever I'm with and just tell them, hey, I, I, I gotta go. You know, because it'll, it'll tap into that emotion and I'll, I'll remember something. Like, um, you know, I remember looking out the window once and I remember and this this actually happened I think I was in Sydney visiting a children's hospital and I smelled smelled something and I remember looking outside the window and it was in the winter time so it was kind of snowing raining but in the courtyard out the window the sun was starting to come out and there was a rainbow that came into that courtyard and that's when I looked at my mom you know kind of half smiling half teary-eyed just saying you know everything's going to be okay isn't it So that, I mean, that, that triggered an an emotional response for sure. Yeah. And, and yet you still put yourself, I mean, I'm flash forwarding now way in advance, but you still like, you're still committed to this. You still, you still go to the hospitals. You still, um, you've, you've, we're going to get into just the crazy things that you've done, (laughs) but, but I mean, I'm watching your documentary, I'm reading about you, I'm learning about you. And honestly, I was even saying to someone this morning, knowing that I was going to talk to you, I was like, at a certain point, I have to ask you, and I didn't mean to ask you this early on, but 
um, you still keep putting yourself in that same situation. You still keep going to the hospitals. You still take the flags with, with signatures to the most remarkable places. You still speak in front of schools. You still like, aren't you tired of thinking and talking about cancer, man? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> sometimes yes, sometimes no. And I think what, what gets me is when, when I'm in touch with someone and it's, it's for a while and this is, I can't tell you how many times this has happened. And then all of a sudden there's silence and I, I know what happened. You know, that, that person passed away. So that hurts and knowing I'm, I'm doing it again and again, I, I, I think one of the reasons I do it is, is in the, is these adventures, like you said, we'll, we'll get to, I think I'm, I'm still trying to prove to myself that I'm still alive, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe I'm still searching for something, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I think the greatest, the greatest currency in the world is how you can make someone feel. And I think that by giving back to someone and giving them that, that, that sense of hope, that they too can continue on, which more people do than don't. I think that's where I get my my, my sense of fulfillment, you know, my, my purpose. And I think I'm gonna continue doing that until I die. You know, just because I, I want to affect people's lives and I want to have them go after, not necessarily Everest in, in you know, specifically because I, I doubt many survivors have Everest in mind, but for some people, their Everest might be literally getting out for the hospital bed and walking around the block. And, and I know what it's like to be laying in the hospital bed, having no hope. So I, I want to instill and I, I want to inject using the, the hospital analogy with the syringe. I want to inject hope in people. And I want people to realize that they too can go after the dreams and goals and let nothing get in their way. But I think the reason I continue doing it is because for me, it it offers us a sense of purpose. Mm. And so if we, so we, we did just take a little trip back to the, to the present, but (laughs) going, going back to the past. And so uh, you survive both treatments, which from the statistics I've heard is just like what 6% chance of survival with your second treatment at the age of 16. I mean, just, was it luck? Was it that, did you just fight your ass off? Like what was it that allowed you to get through that in your opinion? You're absolutely right. The, the, um, the odds of me surviving the, the, the second cancer was roughly 6%, but the chances of me surviving both of them is, uh, it's pretty much the same as winning the lottery four times in a row with the same numbers. I mean, it's, it's astronomical. So it's, it's nearly impossible. And everyone tries to find out what that magic bullet is. You know, is it, is it, is it eating broccoli? You know, is it whatever it's, I think it was like a, a combination of like the perfect storm, but for something good. So every, every little thing came in at the, at the exact precise moment to make it happen. And I think it was a, a combination of uh, like modern medicine, family support, prayer, and just an inner will to keep going. You know, aside. you had that you had that inner drive. I mean, obviously, not every minute of, of right. every single day. I mean, that I don't think you can lay in a hospital bed at night in the dark and, and always have hope every single night, every single day. But but you did have that drive. You did have that fight. Absolutely. I mean, I I, I looked at it and I, I remember being 13 in in the hospital or in in the the, the, my home's shower on my hands and knees just weeping and it was it was also in that uh, the same amount of time that i was in the shower all all my hair fell out and and i remember pulling chunks of hair out of the drain just so the water could go down but i I also realized that in that uh, that moment of of essentially utter despair that I had two choices. I could either fight for my life or give up and die. And, and the choice was mine. And I was going to hold on and fight and, and 
do everything I possibly could until the very last breath. Having been there and talking to all these people, though, my, as, as, you're, as you're saying this, my, my thought is like, and most people would give up, wouldn't they? And you're remarkable, but you're much closer to this than I am. In your experience, when push comes to shove, do most people fight or do they fall into apathy? Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think, honestly, it's, it's a combination of that. I think some maybe it's it's 50-50 or maybe 60% fight, 40% give up. But I think and and there's there's there have been numerous studies on this where if you ask a patient who's recently diagnosed with cancer what they plan on doing or or what what they see themselves doing in 10 years and they and they can actually say something um their chances of survival is something astronomical compared to the people who don't have that. And I think it goes back to um, a, a sense of purpose. If, if you feel like you, you want to continue forward with life and, and do something with it, then I think you will. But the people who, who don't have that sense of purpose and they give up, they have nothing to live for. Mm. So if, if, if you could hold on to something, you know, whatever it might be, it, it, it could be different for you. It could be different for me. It could be different, different for everyone. What, what was it? What was it for you? What, you know, in that you're 16, you know, you don't remember most of it, but, but coming out of the treatment, what was the thing the second time? Cause I would be thinking, gosh, there's going to be a third time. There's going to be a fourth time. There's going to be a fifth time. Like, like I, I would, I would start to connect dots and see a pattern, even if it wasn't there. Right. What was the thing? What was that thing that you were holding on to as you came out of your second treatment? I honestly, I think it was my family. Like I, I thought that I, I didn't want to leave my mom and dad because I didn't want to hurt them. So it, it really wasn't, it, it was a couple things. Yes, it was me fighting for my life. And I knew that, you know, I was a teenager. I was like, I, I want to live to be a hundred. And while I was live, while I was sitting in the hospital bed, I remember watching the, the Hawaii Ironman on TV. And I thought to myself, if I get better, I want to finish that race. And then I started thinking about all the other things that I, I, I haven't been able to do. And I, I think what coming out of it was I didn't want my mom and dad to go through the pain of losing a firstborn son. And so for you, um, when did Everest pop into your mind? And I'm more curious at when it went from being a flirtation or a lark to like, <laughs> you know, you're training and you got, you're figuring out flights and stuff. Like, like, did you, did you guys grow up? Like, did you grow up with money? Like were your parents well to do enough that like they could afford to take this time off for your treatments? They could afford private health. They could afford to fly you to, to Mount Everest to, to climb it. Like, like I, I'm curious at this moment in your life where you go from, from like surviving to like, I'm going to go out and crush something. <laughs> Well, well, I, I, like I said, I grew up in a small town, Willard, Ohio. I mean, the population is 5,000 people. My dad, I think he was the only dentist in town. And because it was a farming community, um, oftentimes people didn't have money to pay for his services. So he exchanged. So we, we would always have fresh vegetables year round. So did we grow up with money? No, not necessarily. Um, did they pay for my flight and everything to go to Everest? Not at all. In fact, I sold my entire life savings to go do that. And so when I did book the flights, my brother went with me. He was at base camp. He was like my base camp coordinator. Um, if, if I was coming home, I was coming home to, you know, no car. When, when I was born, mom and dad invested in like $1,000 in some, some stocks, you know, they're just reinvesting shares. I sold all of those. I was coming home to basically nothing. And I was going to have to rebuild my entire life again. And when you say if you were coming home, is that because the 25% mortality rate on Everest or yeah. what, what, like, like, was that because I'm, again, I'm watching your story and I'm going like, like I've thought Everest, no way it, for me, like, like, I don't like those odds, but I can't figure out if you're like, if you got nothing to lose or if you're just like, I'm going to conquer death or if you're confident in yourself or what, but, but it's surprising to me that you even said if I was coming home. So that must've been in your mind. <laughs> it, and, and I say that because it's, it's kind of tongue in cheek. My, my parents have always supported everything I've done. 
you know, they've always been behind me, not necessarily financially, like, like I said earlier, but um, they've always been there. They've also always told me what they honestly think of what I'm doing. So, <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> great. So, when I was leaving, when my brother and I, because I was in Jacksonville, Florida, working on my master's, my doctorate, my, my brother just graduated college. My parents were living in Hilton Head. We drove up there and told them of everything we were doing. And I remember when we left driving from from South Carolina to Colorado so I could train. Um, And again, that's when we were living off of my brother's savings, my savings, like everything I I had worked for my entire life, went to a bank account. We were just dripping it out. Um, But I remember my dad looking at me and saying, we didn't get you through two cancers to go kill yourself on a hunk of rock and ice. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I was like, I appreciate it, Dad. I love you. And I know I have your support. And I also appreciate your honesty. Um, because I think in, in all, all my adventures, I've always listened to my gut. You know, I've, I've lost a number of, of friends in the mountains. But I've, I've, I've always taken calculated risks. And if, if I felt uncomfortable about doing something, I wouldn't do it. Yes, there are some uh, unforeseen things like avalanches that you have no control over, but I'm going to do everything I can in my control to make sure I'm safe. And so uh, you're prepping for Mount Everest again. When what what is flicking in your head that goes from idea or flirtation to action? Because there's something there. <laughs> there's something there, man. <laughs> I, I think it was that, like, like I said, my brother graduated from college. I drove up to go get him. So what was that? 15, 16 hour drive, say, um, maybe a little bit longer driving back down. I, I just told him I had this idea that I, I wanted to be the first cancer survivor to climb Mount Everest. And I'm sure whenever I told, when I was, when I was thinking about doing that, I'm sure everybody I spoke to just, you know, looked at me like, they are you thinking like what's yeah. wrong with you where does this idea come from like you have no climbing experience you have nothing you live in jacksonville florida where the highest point is the top of the four seasons hotel in miami right so yeah. you're like what you, you live on a sandbar you're gonna be you're now you're gonna be a mountaineer so i i, I just started doing more research and more research and reading more about it i became i don't want to say addicted to it Obsessed, but it was just maybe obsessed could be. And I, I decided that I, that was, I was going to do it. And when I, when I put my mind to something, the, the blinders go on and I find a way to make it happen. And that's exactly what we did. I mean, my brother and I, I live in Colorado. Now we moved out here and we, we were homeless for two months before we even found a place to live. We were living out of the back of a Honda civic in in a tent. My office was a payphone bank in the library for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you rope your brother into this? He's just he, like, I, I, he looks up to you for sure. He feels like, how did you get him to come along on this journey with you? 21 years old, just graduated from college. He's like, sure, I'll go on the adventure. <laughs> okay. So there wasn't much thought, but, but there must have been, again, a time where you're on day 60 of sleeping in the back of your Honda, where you're just like, what are we doing? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we were living off of ramen for a while. You know, we would buy some vegetables and cut up the vegetables and put it in the ramen. And we were, it was, some people say we were on a shoestring budget. We, we didn't even have shoelaces. We were on a Velcro budget at that time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I, I don't want to diminish anything because, because if you weren't at that point, you have become like a true adventure adventurer is that i mean i don't even know what the term is but like you no. have you have not parachuted in or done the tourist versions of climbing seven mountains or hitting the south pole or the north pole or um gosh i, I was reading out about something else you've also completed um some kind of race or something that's amazing like you're just doing thing after thing after thing but but it's like the real version of it it's not like the disneyland version of any of this <laughs> Right. It's, it's not it's not the uh, the Everest version of the roller coaster ride in Orlando. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Right. Where it's like my my little son still remembers. He's like, I love that one where you go right. around the rocks and stuff. Right. Like like this is at what point 
in in this first trek did it because i i saw i saw it hit you in in some future treks and footage i was watching where it's like oh this is real and someone's like yeah you got to get real about this but at what point did it go from i'm doing this to i'm doing this to i don't want to do this but it's too late to back out or whatever it might have been for you <laughs> There, there, there were a, a couple moments on the mountains. One was on Everest. I was at I was at Camp Three, and to kind of paint the picture, Camp Three is situated on uh, what's called the Lhotse Ice Face, which is a sheet of ice at a forty-five degree angle that goes on for a mile. So, like one wrong step, a half an inch in one direction, and, and you you tumble. I mean, I, I had a friend who he unclipped from the fixed rope, and he was delirious on his way down, and tumbled. You know, and, and didn't stop until he hit the bottom and he ended up dying because they just barely could find his body. Um, but I was I was up there and I remember going to sleep. Uh, well, having having dinner at about six, maybe six thirty, sun was going down and we had the uh, like dehydrated vegetables or a beef stew. It's like the, the little chunks of orange carrots, the round peas, those spiral noodles and the beef chunks and went to bed, you know, restless night, woke up the next morning and I, I, I had to vomit. I, I had to get everything out. I unzipped the tent, you know, project out everything out and I could still see the, the orange cubed carrot, the pea, the spiral noodles and the beef chunks. What that and then what that meant was that my my stomach wasn't digesting anything. My my you didn't chew very much either. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to chew it, man. I on that part. <laughs> but it um it meant that my 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 body was was suffering the altitude. You know, it, it, the conditions of the altitude were getting to my body, and what was happening was my brain was swelling. It, which is called um, uh, high altitude cerebral edema. So essentially altitude induced swelling in the brain, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I physically couldn't move from camp three to go to camp four when we were supposed to go from camp three to camp four that day and then go up for the summit the next night because there were four, four camps on the south side, the route that we took up. Um, we were at camp three. I had that issue. Every other group who was on the same schedule as us went from camp three to camp four when I couldn't, and they were going to go for the summit that night. They went up towards the summit. Bad weather came in. Not a single person summited that day. Hmm. So I stayed at camp three, sleeping on oxygen, just resting. Day after, we stormed up to camp four, rested at camp four, and summited. And there was a slight breeze at the top. So I, I, I look back at, at things like that, you know, that are out of my control. And I, I, I think that I have the world's worst good luck. <laughs> like everything bad happens, but it's, but it's for a good reason. You know, and I, and I try to focus on those, those positive aspects. And I also think that I have a fleet of guardian angels working on overtime. And I pray to God they never go on vacation. And so you you climb everest well i'm sure you've been asked this a million times and i apologize about that but i'm curious what is the feeling other than elation what is what is it like being on the peak once once you get there and it kind of settles in like you realize you're there take some pictures the first thing that popped to my mind was holy I have to go back down. <laughs> <laughs> I love that reaction. It's like, we did it. And then you're like, oh, yeah. no. <laughs> Listen, Absolutely. The trip home after vacation is never as much fun as the trip there is, right? Exactly. So that's, exa that, that's what happened. I kind of looked around and thought, huh. I'm only halfway because like in documentaries, you know, you watch the true North in all those films, you get to the top, you get to the crux, you get to the, you, the, the end. And all of a sudden the movie's over. Like, well, how the hell do I get home? Like, they're, they're, there's, no they're not there's no helicopter picking you up. No. <laughs> you <home> or anything. <laughs> so how, how long did you stay up there? 
We, we were up there for about 30 minutes. I mean, like I said, there was just a slight breeze. Usually you're up there, you take a picture and you, you head back down because you, you, your body doesn't handle the altitude well. Um, yeah. And the bad weather usually comes in, but it was, it was perfect. It was like the heavens opened up and said, oh, welcome. That's amazing. And so, uh, you know, I've heard people talk, this, this doesn't compare at all, but I, I just sold... I didn't, I didn't get a motorcycle until a few years ago because I was too afraid to be on the road and all of this stuff. And finally I was like, I'm going to need a motorcycle. I'm going to do this. I'm going to face my fears. And then I just sold my first motorcycle and a little ping inside me was like, that's my first and I'm never going to have another first. And even though, you know, it's, it's a super moto bike and it's not that fast and it's not that, even though it, like I, I hardly ever ride, it's not that comfortable, but it's still my first. Yeah. And I've heard people talk about like, you know, their first Ferrari, right? Like, you know, their second, their eighth, their 10th isn't as much fun. Now you summited <laughs> and then you decide you're going to go and do this a few more times, let's say. As you think through each one, did, did, did each experience, obviously totally unique and different, but did each experience, um, how did it change how you approached the next one? Because the second summit must not have been as rewarding as the first, I'm guessing. Or how did, how did those all compare? You're, you're right. They're abs- absolutely different. Um, each, each one was, was unique in the aspect of, of technicality, like the technical aspect of it. Obviously location because, you know, so, so real uh, quick, cause I don't have them memorized. What are all the mountains that you've climbed? So Everest was the first one, you know, that's the highest mountain in Asia. Then I went to Kilimanjaro, Africa, um, Elber, Elbrus in, um, Russia. So that's, that's Europe. Um, then I went to Aconcagua, South America, then Antarctica. I climbed Vincent, Vincent Massif, then Australia, which in Colorado right now, my house is almost the same height as that mountain. Um, that's uh, Kosciuszko. And then the last one is Denali up in Alaska for North America. But, but each of them, they have their, their different, different problems. But for each one of the continents, each one of the mountains, and it started with Everest. I actually took a flag, as, as you saw from the um, uh, from True North. Each, each of the ones I took up the mountain were a little bit smaller, you know, maybe, I don't know, two feet by a foot or something. And they always had names of people touched by cancer on there. So and, and it was always folded up in my chest pocket close to my heart. As, as always, as, as a reminder of my goals and why I was doing what I was doing. So my, my inspiration, essentially. And I didn't see them as names. I saw them as people. And those people were, were, were carrying me up to each one of the mountains. And I always left. I always still do leave the flag up there. And it's a, a tr- tremendous emotional experience um, on each one of them. And I, I remember very vividly being on the top of um, Aconcagua, which I said was the first, second, third, the fourth one. And I remember calling my mom for my satellite phone. And because it's such an emotional thing for me, um, I'm, I'm on my satellite phone and she picks up and she's like, hello. And I'm like, <laughs> mom. <laughs> no, I'm oh, no, she tears. thinks you're dying. Yeah. Right. So I'm in tears and she goes, Sean, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And she goes, did you make it? I'm like, <laughs> Uh huh. And she goes, "Okay, get back down safely." I'm like, "Okay." And that was the whole conversation. <laughs> so each one of them have been very emotional because it's it's not me. It's 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 those people. It's it's helping people believe in themselves. You know, because everybody has a mountain to climb. You just have to find a purpose and in, in why you're doing it. Yeah. Did it get easier as you went through kind of it the got, seven? It, it got more fun. More fun. How so? More fun. Because I was less worried about making it to the top and I was more concerned about enjoying the journey. Mm. You know, and, I, and I've, I've, I, I take, like I said, I take a group up Kilimanjaro every year as a fundraiser for a cancer charity. And we're leaving July 24th, if you want to go. Um, <laughs> this will be my 21st summit of Kilimanjaro. And it's, it's not, no longer, it's actually right there. That's the top. 
Um, it's no longer about the mountain. It's about the people. And I think you, I think you'll resonate with this a lot because you have children. You get to not necessarily an age, but you get to a, a, a stage or a point in your life where, say for Christmas, you get more out of giving gifts than you do receiving gifts. It's the same thing when I get people to the top of Kilimanjaro. I love, and this is going to sound awful, I love seeing people cry. <laughs> they get up there and they're so incredibly emotional. Everybody is hugging each other. It's waterworks big time because it's such an accomplishment. And in an instant, it changes someone's life. And they always, they, people always come up and say, thank you so much for getting me here. And I turn around and say, I, did, I didn't get you here. And then people realize, oh my God, I did that on my own. So I think that's why I, I do it now. I want people to believe they can do it on their own. And having spent all of these years first fighting off death with your own sickness and then facing death in these kind of perilous conditions. And as you've mentioned, you know, people pass away doing what you do. And people you know have passed away doing what you do. How have you gotten comfortable with this? Or how have you, I guess, have you gotten to a place where you've been able to do what you want to do and still be comfortable knowing that you could die doing this? I, I, I think that, that's a great question. And, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about it. And without getting too philosophical, we're all going to get, gonna get, die. Fi get philosophical <laughs> on me, man. It, that's, we have an hour here. That's what this is about. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, we, we are all at some point in our lives going to die. Um, I don't know. Have you ever heard of or seen the movie um, uh, secondhand lions? I've not. No. Okay. Check it out when you get a chance. It, I won't, I won't give too much away. Um, but they, they went out with their boots on. And I think I'm more afraid of not living than I am of dying. Why, why would I, after everything I've been through with the cancers, why would I sit on my couch in my house and be safe? There's an entire world out there to explore. Why would I let fear get in the way of holding me back from what I want to, what I want to see? And if I want to try something, why wouldn't I? If I want to do something, why wouldn't I try to do it? You know, I don't, I don't understand. Uh, I guess some people don't do it because they're afraid of what others think about them, which brings me to another point. Why are more, why are so many people more, more concerned of, of what others think of them than what they think of themselves? So as soon as you focus on what you want to do and you find your personal core values and you foster those, what means most to you, Go out and explore the world. Do it on your own terms. Live a life that you want to live. Go after your own goals, your own dreams. Don't go after somebody else's goals and dreams because as soon as you do that, you start losing who you are. So again, why would I, after everything I've been through, sit at home and be safe and, and say I live to be 100 years old, which is, which is another goal of mine. <laughs> I see what I can do. But why would I do that and be in a hospital bed or be at home in a wheelchair or whatever it might be and look back at 99 years of my life and say, wow, I made it this far and I was safe and I never lived. I was alive, but I never lived. And I just have to, I have to absorb that because it's remarkable, honestly. I almost don't want to take the conversation another way. It's just so good, Sean. Man, it's, uh, it's it's true. I mean, if if you want to, we can we can continue going down there. I mean, how many things, you know, kind of turning it back on onto you? How many things have you looked at in your life that you didn't do? And I don't want many. to say because of your kids. Yeah, no, 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 too many. The reason why I'm hosting the We Do Hard Things podcast is because I have realized that I've played too small, like think big, be bold, say yes. The reason that's here is because by nature in the past, I'm going to say not now, but in the past, I wouldn't think big. 
I, I wasn't bold and I would say no to like my natural reaction is no to everything, you know, <laughs> like I'm watching your doc again and I'm reading about you and I'm so like, why the hell would this guy? Okay. There, there has to be something to this. Like there has to be, there has to be something to this. And that's what I'm always so curious about. Like what were the little things that ticked off? What were the little domino effects? What were the things that happened? Because I don't want I don't want to think small and, and, and not hit the high hopes that I have for my life. And I, I don't want to be someone who's not bold. I don't want to be seen as not bold. I don't want to not be bold. I don't want to not feel bold. And gosh, saying no to things makes you feel safe and comfortable. But like you said, it's a very small way to live. So um, I want those things, which is why I'm asking you. <laughs> and and I, I think it's... If, if you look back at your life, you are where you are right now because of every seemingly mundane choice you've made up to this point. Every choice you've ever made in your life has brought you to where you are right now. Knowing where you are now, if you want to change who you are, change what you do. So just look at one thing that has the most control over you. You know, you're, you're fearful of X as opposed to thinking, oh, I don't want that to happen. Look at it from a different perspective and say, I want this to happen. So instead of saying, you know, um, I, I don't want to be afraid, which right back there, you have it written perfectly, be bold because your brain still hears that negative. I mean, imagine going back again to the, to the cancers. How do you think I would have turned out if I kept constantly telling myself, don't die, don't die, don't die? as opposed to, I want to live. So I think with, with everything now, I, I, I'm, I'm very mindful and very conscious of, again, every seemingly mundane choice that I'm given. And it, and it also goes back to the fact that, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I'm, I'm, I climbed Everest with one lung. People ask me, how is that even physiologically possible? It's possible because as soon as I had that surgery, I have both of them, but there's, there's so much scar tissue over here. There's no oxygen transfer. As soon as I could breathe without having the pain from the cracked ribs, I, I've taught myself how to nearly every breath utilize the entire function of my lungs. I mean, the only times that, that you breathe deeply are when you're asleep and when you're a baby or when you're paying attention to it. Because as adults, when we start to get stressed, <laughs> you know, you start breathing through your upper chest, your upper respiratory system, which then fosters more stress, which fosters more anxiety as a physiological, at the, at the physiological, as, as, as a physiological response. So if you can focus on breathing from your diaphragm, utilizing your entire lung capacity, which I've had to do. I was forced to do it because of the lack of, of the, the lung on my right side. So that's how it's possible to climb Everest with one lung. Same thing about going after any goal that you want in your life. Start somewhere. Start now. Decide that you want it moving forward. You can't change your past, but you can change who you are by moving forward. And like I said, if you want to change what, what you have, who you are, change what you do. Because we're, we are all, human beings are, are creatures of habit. You know, and, and there's that saying, you are what you eat, but you are what you consume. So if you're constantly telling yourself things like, oh, hey, and it starts when you're a kid, like with your with your kids, how many times do you probably tell them during the day, hey, don't do that. Hey, be careful. <laughs> I don't and I don't have any kids. A lot. Right? <laughs> A lot. How, do you, how do you think it would be if, if you encourage them as opposed to saying, hey, don't do that or, hey, be careful. Um, you know, you change, you turned it around to be something more positive because all they're hearing is, man, dad doesn't let me do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, but if, if, if you encourage that even in yourself as opposed to, oh, I can't do that. Well, find a way to do something that you can do or as opposed to um, walking down the street, telling yourself, don't trip, don't trip. Turn it around and tell yourself, stand tall, walk strong as opposed so, so to telling you what's was that this learned or were you always a very optimistic person? I, th I think it was learned just going through my cancers again, you know, going back to that, that fragile child on, on the bottom of the shower floor. That's when I decided I didn't want to focus on not dying. I wanted to focus on living. 
because in, in college, I also studied psychology. I started off molecular bio and uh, it's, it's really difficult to, to pass organic chemistry and immunology if you don't open a book and you're parting so much. So I changed to something else. Uh, but I learned a lot about the, the a lot about the mind and the brain and how it worked, you know, the synaptic connections, right? Left prefrontal cortex. And then you can change it through neuroplasticity. It's, it's been proven, but you have to be a mindful of it. And it has to become a pattern day in, day out. And so you, you move on from, from climbing these, and I mean, I don't know the exact terms, but you move on from climbing these amazing mountains to, then deciding that you want to hit the Explorer Grand Cup, the Explorer Grand Prix. I can't remember the name of the term, it's, but if as soon as I say it, it's it's the Explorer's Grand Slam, which sounds like a Denny's breakfast platter. <laughs> I'm Canadian. We don't have a lot of Denny's up right. here, but but I hear what you're saying. And so this is when you can hit, when you can complete every major climb and the South Pole and go to the North Pole, all kind of within your life. Seven summits is, yeah, the highest mountain every continent is called the Seven Summits. The two poles are called the Explorer's Grand Slam. And I'm the only, I'm, I'm the only cancer survivor to do that. And if you tag on the, the World Championship Ironman Triathlon in Hawaii, I'm, I'm actually the only person to ever do, do all that. It's, it's remarkable. At what, at what point, if at all, did it flip over to this is something I think I can do to this is going to happen. And, um, and I don't know if that's the way you think when you're going to an expedition or if you go into an expedition going very seriously going like, um, yeah, I may have to pull out and that's okay. Um, like some of your colleagues have had to in the past, but was there a certain point where it, again, it goes from flirtation or idea to like, Oh, this is a real thing. This is, this is something that's actually going to happen. I'm going to make this happen. I, I think it's always, I've always known that I was going to have, so whenever I, I came up with the idea, I, I was going to find a way to make it happen. But the difference, I think, between the way, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in the mind-body connection. I, I, I do visualization every night. And the big difference between how I do it and how I think, I think how other people do it two main differences most people visualize themselves from the first person point of view which is great you know seeing themselves accomplishing whatever one whatever they want you know get, sitting in their new ferrari their first ferrari whatever right yeah so they, so they're visually sitting in it hands right. on the wheel looking down like all first person kind of stuff exactly i take it further where i utilize my other senses so on everest I could smell the ozone. I heard the styrofoam sound of the, the snow crunching beneath my feet. I felt the, the, the sun's radiation on my face and I could feel I, all of that. But then I take it another step further where I tap and this is, I think this is key that most people don't do. How does it make you feel? You know, and again, it's it's not the the Ferrari doesn't make you feel that way, but how do you feel being in the Ferrari? The, the car doesn't make you feel that way. You feel that way. How does that make you feel? And I, I do that every night with with things. And a, another thing is, I'm trying to trying to put it back together. Um, another another component that I bring in too is I always visualize potential obstacles. So with Everest, the, the ladders, you know, there are ladders, the aluminum ladders that span crevasses, um, the North Pole, uh, polar bears, uh, for crying out loud, right? Yeah. Um, so I uh, visualized... I brought things you didn't seem very comfortable with. <laughs> I was going to say... I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, you, you kind of danced across some of them. Absolutely. So those they're called open leads, which are the open sections of, of water, um, open sections of the ice where the water is just frozen over going to the North Pole. So I visualize all that stuff and I, I see how I'm going to deal with that before it happens. So that way, when it does happen, I can deal with it almost instantly without thinking. Hmm. So I think that's a big component too. So anybody can use it. You go into a meeting for crying out loud, you know, you're going to get some feedback on a presentation. Okay. Well say, you know, Mr. Simmons, 
one is going to respond by saying something that's nasty. How are you going to respond? You know, come up with those responses, come up with those actions before it happens. So, you know, instinctively how to react when it does happen or if it, if it happens, if it doesn't happen, fantastic. You're, you're overprepared. Yeah. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, something that, that did catch me in the doc is towards the end um, of your journey. Uh, and and I, I mean, I'm, I, I went to film school. I own, I own a, a marketing agency. So I understand that we can take things out of time and out of context just to build a story. But towards the end of the documentary, you mentioned that there's a lot of time when you're climbing, when you're doing these expeditions, there's a lot of time for you to be in your own head. And you, and you said, um, you know, time to really think about what's important in life or what the meaning of life is. I wrote down the quote, but I don't have it in front of me. But then you never went on to give any more context. And I was like, what, what is, I mean, and you may have shared it already with, with the idea of living a full life fully. But when you're rolling these things around in your head and you're spending day after day after day or hour after hour after hour of doing these long, hard, repetitive tasks and you're thinking about these big questions, what do you end up narrowing in on? Great question. I, I think because I'm, I'm, I'm taking myself back to, I know that there was a moment in there. We were close to the north, close to 90 degree north. <laughs> And I, I got so bored, I started counting my steps. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a tip. When I get really bored, I just need to find something to count. Yeah. yeah right. I've done that in a car going across Montana, where you're literally like, hey, that peak, I bet that's 13 miles away. And then you just count the mile markers to see if you're kind of close. <laughs> so I think yours is more extreme than me sitting in a suburban going across Montana, but still. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that definitely went through my mind, but just getting more of a, of a of a picture of you know the again the end result and how I feel at the end, but also questions of it, it's amazing how quickly the brain works. So I think at one point I was elated. I was like, "This is awesome! This is fantastic! Let's keep going!" And then two steps later, what the hell am I doing? It's freaking cold here. You know, <laughs> this sucks. But then it changes again. So every step was almost a different thought. But I think honing in on the, the people who were on the, in the sled, the people who were on the flag, that's what pushed me forward. That's what kept me going. Like, all right, why am I here? Why am I doing this? I could die. Yeah, but you know what? You're going to die eventually at some point. Why not go out doing something you love? Or why not go out and do something that not many people have done before? Why not go out there and use it as a vehicle to, ins uh, to inspire and empower others? Yeah. So I kept thinking about other people and, and how I can encourage them with, without having to go through what I went through. Yeah. I, I always think in terms of costs, um, and I don't know if it's, you know, I've, I'm trying to get through a scarcity mindset and all of these things, but everything that you do, if you're pursuing one thing, it's costing you in some other area. And um, as you went through each of these amazing adventures, did you leave a part of yourself somewhere or... Did, did, did all of this focus and all of this time come at a cost? Obviously, you're willing to pay it at this point, but, but what has all of this stuff cost you? Great question. And I think that's the first time anyone's ever asked me that. And I love it because I've, I've actually been thinking about it a lot recently. Because if, if you look at the, the typical person's life uh, someone who's my age I'll, I'll say my friends for example we graduated college they they started working um, some of them went to grad school started working got married had some kids worked their way up the chain got raises now their kids are you know potentially um, getting ready for high school whatever it might be and they're saving for college and then after saving money, they're probably going to go on trips and adventures around the world or go exploring. 
I graduated college, went for my master's, went exploring. I just got, I'm 46 now. I just got married two years ago. Um, so I think in my life, I lost that normalcy of growing up, you know, that, that quote unquote normal life. But I don't see it as too much of an expense. And I, I, I look at it now that I am where I am, again, based on all the choices I've made in, in my past. And I own those 100%. Those were all my choices. No one forced me to do what I did. And do I regret anything? Not at all. But now I'm to the point where I'm trying to build um, something that can help others because I've, I've accomplished, again, what no one in history has ever done before. And I'm trying to teach people how they can do it as well. So if, if you look at quite a few of, of, of um, the top athletes in the world, the, the wealthy people in the world, um, you, it, you don't have to peel back too many layers to see that a lot of people are unhappy because they think that Ferrari is going to, that first Ferrari maybe gave them that feeling. And then they had to get another one to make them uh, feel the same way they did when they got the first one. But that's not the case. And so many people are looking for outside things to make them feel happy on the inside. So that's what I mean, you know, and, and some people who may be um, divorced three or four times, their, their kids hate them, you know, and, and they wonder why. Well, peel back those layers. And for people who are, who are afraid to, to, to take a, a chance on their lives, you know, maybe they have something holding them back. I, I'm, I'm putting together and I have put together the Summit Challenge, which is walking people through step by step how to accomplish what you want to accomplish. It could be being who you want to be, you know, being a better dad, being a better wife, better, a better whatever you want, a better person. You, it doesn't matter. It's still the same, same idea and same concept. This is still the same linear journey, but it's based on what means most to you. But so at the beginning of it, I help you figure out what your personal core values are. And then you start focusing more attention on the ones where you're lacking. And I think that's what I do every day. I look at, okay, well, where do I want to focus today? Where do I want to put my energy and attention to, to, to today? And it becomes this very um, conscious effort of, of my life direction and my life path. Has, has this work, I, I do know that you're working on a book uh, or you've worked on a book that's coming out in the fall. Is, is this kind of the foundation for where the book will take you? It, it is. It kind of gives you that inside glimpse and maybe like the first step because it, it helps people understand a little bit how the mind works. And basically with the, excuse me, the concept of whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. So it helps people with that synaptic connection to build more, more synapses in their left prefrontal cortex to be more open, to be more um, optimistic. Because you can change how you see the world. The world's not going to change. I mean, theoretically, it can, you know, climate change, everything else. But the world's not going to change for you. And if you want to see a different perspective on the world, you need to change. And for people who are willing to do that, like I said, you peel back the layers and you don't have to peel back too far. You'll find a lot of unhappy people, truly unhappy people, because not many people are truly happy. And our, we, we have one life, man. We got to live it. I love it. For you at the end of the day, it all comes down to what? It all comes down to purpose. And I remember, I remember being on a, a flight from Dallas to Hong Kong. Uh, you know, that, that's what, 17, 18 hours, something crazy. And I was sitting next to a guy who took that flight every other week. You know, I, I can't even imagine. And I, I, I had a lot of time with him and we were talking back and forth. He had a couple glasses of wine, you know, breakfast, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner. I think we had it twice on that flight. Um, and we just kept talking about how he, he wanted to keep making more money and more money and more money. And I started asking about his family because he said that he missed his son's first words. He missed his son's first steps. He missed his son hitting the ball off the tee, you know, playing tee ball. 
And I, I asked him a, a question before we landed. I asked him, have you fulfilled your life's purpose? Are you still alive? And he kind of sat there and thought about it for a while. And he told me when we landed, when we were, I guess, getting off the plane, deboarding, um, he said that was his last trip to Hong Kong. He was going to spend more time with his family. He's made enough money. Like, how much is enough? Focus on what's important to you and find a purpose. What a story. <laughs> okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, have something to look forward to. It'll increase your chances of overcoming those difficult situations. Number two, the world isn't going to change for your happiness. If you want to be happy, you need to change how you look at the world. And number three, my goodness, Sean taught me this. No goal is too big. Just think, like with no climbing experience at all, and with only one working lung, Sean was eventually able to summit Mount Everest and so much more. So what is your Mount Everest? Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world and we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen because we do hard things. If you need more Next Level Conversations, you have got to watch the one, the only Iron Cowboy. Click on the link right over there. I'll see you there. On to, to gratitude and the things that we get to do. I don't have to go on a 140 mile bike ride. I don't have to do Eco Challenge. I get to do those things. Changes the mindset when you're out there suffering.